we have a lot of participants from all over the world here. Someone's even logging in at 4 a.m. in Malaysia. They might also be really early in Singapore. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, my name is Rachel. I work with Amity, so I'm part of the uh, team for the Yes Alumni Interfaith Harmony Online Workshop. This is session number two. We'll be having a panel discussion with some interfaith experts. But before we get to them, I want to give you all a few reminders about how to use Zoom. So you've all used Zoom before, hopefully. Uh, just be sure to turn off your camera and your microphones. Today is all about our panelists. We do want you to be able to interact. So open up that chat box. You can chat with each other. You can chat with us. If you have any technical difficulties and you need some support, you should chat with Christine Texport. If you have questions that you would like us to ask the panelists, you're welcome to put them in the group chat or to chat with Amadeus HQ Tracy. So those are your two people. Tech support is Christine Tech Support. Questions go to Amity's HQ Tracy. We are recording this, so if there are things you want to watch again later, you're welcome to do that. Um, and I think that that's about it. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this to the panelists. I'll be asking questions, but I will not be on camera. Feel free to engage through the chat box. Here we go. All right, thank you all three of our panelists for being here to start off our conversation. Let's just go um, from left to right. And if each of you could please introduce yourself, including your name and what you do in terms of religious, spiritual or interfaith work or community service for about three minutes each. Okay, I'll begin. Um, my name is Paul Heck and I, I am a professor of religious studies at Georgetown University. And I'm also the director of the study of religions across civilizations uh, in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University. So I should say that, first of all, I'm a scholar, um, but my area is the study of religious pluralism. So I study religious pluralism as a reality, and so not just as a nice idea or a possibility. Um, and that feeds into another point I'd like to make. I'm a scholar, but I'd also call myself an activist scholar or a populist scholar. Uh, so just quickly, a little bit on my personal background. I'm a Christian, I'm a Roman Catholic, so that's very much at the center of my life. But I grew up in a suburb of Boston where uh, we were the only non-Jews uh, on the block. And so Judaism is an important part of my life. And then uh, after college, I lived in England uh, in uh, doing a master's degree, and um, I was in the dorm with students from all over the world, and I, and I began to get to know Muslims. And so that began my um, interest in Islam, and I eventually did uh, specialization in Islam. And so I guess what I want to say is, though I'm very rooted in my own Christian tradition, the Jew is not other to me, nor is the Muslim other to me. And so that, for me, uh, raised a very uh, important question about how we understand the religious, uh, the, how do we acquire religious knowledge of the other person? And so that led me to, to begin this project, SORAC, the study of religions across civilization. And the key idea in that project is we have exchange programs uh, between America and Morocco, for the most part, students who do uh, the study of religion, but the basic idea is how do we acquire uh, religious knowledge, especially of uh, another tradition? And so we have something we call scholarly companionship. That's the first thing. The idea is that I can't really acquire knowledge of the other person unless we develop a friendship. So friendship is key to acquiring knowledge. And so that's part of my scholarly cap, if you want. Uh, but at the same time, there's this other side. We want to make connections. Uh, we don't want to just be kind of these theoretical ideas about theology and religion. We make connections between religious meanings and civil society. And, and we get involved in civil society activity and we look for religious meanings in civil society. So the core question there for me is what makes us human? And um, I think we all agree that it's not state power. We need states, we need political uh, institutions but uh, that's not what makes us uh, human. And so uh, what we're trying to do in our organization, we're seeking religious knowledge, uh, but also reflecting on the uh, meanings of religion in relation to civil society. And so in that sense, the religious knowledge that we're trying to acquire and pursue and discover is really about making us human. And so that's another key element of what I do. How does religious knowledge uh, make us human? For many people, 
there's lots of ambiguities about religion. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it the cause for violence? Or is it the cause for peace? So that's what we're trying to do. So that's a little bit about who I am. So I'm Linda Olson Peebles, and I'm an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister, a religious leader of a large congregation close to where we are now in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm also a community organizer, and by that I mean someone who follows the principles of Saul Alinsky and organizing, which starts with one-on-one -on -one relationships, uh, getting to know people, listening to people's real needs, figuring out what is an actionable win that you can make. So in other words, not trying to bring world peace, but trying to figure out one thing you could do that could make a change. And then basically equipping the people that are concerned but that they can, they can work on this themselves. So um, leaders in community organizing, we tend to be both teachers, but also accompaniers, where we stand in solidarity and support. We don't fix problems for people. We help people uh, learn how to fix their problems. And my interest in this interfaith work, actually, I've always been interested in learning about other religions because Unitarian Universalism itself is not belief-based. Um, it's a it's a religion that believe that it's centered on love, and so it's a matter of what you love and how will you live with one another. So, um, my seminary had many students with, from different faiths in my seminary. What actually happened with my getting into community organizing was after 9/11 happened. Our church is two miles from the Pentagon, where a plane flew in and killed over 300 people, and our area was in shock. Our um, Muslim neighbors were in fear. So the rabbis, the imams, the priests, the preachers, we all got together to figure out how can we support one another. And we spent two or three years getting to know each other, having conversations about what our faith leads us to. And we made the decision to um, put this interfaith conversation into action as opposed to being scholars or theologians or educators. We decided, and so that's when we decided to form um, community organizing project, which is Interfaith, and it's now become very powerful in Virginia. This year, past year, we won the Governor's Award for our organization that was started by this group of imams and priests and rabbis and preachers. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Seth Hassan Akhlaab, Imam of Imam Mahdi Center in North Virginia. Actually, I am originally from Afghanistan. I was born in Afghanistan and grew up in Iran. <coughs> Sorry, in two different uh, in two different uh, contexts. Uh, so I graduated also from two different contexts, from uh, seminary or madrasa, and also I graduated from university or modern institution of education. Uh, my major in Islamic study uh, was focused on jurisprudence or fiqh or Islamic ahkam. <coughs> And my major in uh, university was focusing on comparative philosophy between Islamic and non-Islamic philosophies. Uh, first time I came to the US, 2009, for the dialogue among religion and philosophy uh, uh, that was uh, held at uh, Catholic University of America. And then 2011, I came here by the Muslim community to serve as Imam and still I'm working with them in North Virginia uh, in two different contexts. I continue my work uh, in academia. I work on the interreligious dialogue to uh, work on the theory and the understanding each other's, particularly the different religion and faith. And in practice, I'm working with my community among my center in North Virginia. I give them a lecture uh, every week, particularly for Islamic occasion, like uh, Ramadan, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al azha and like that. Maybe an uh, interesting point is that I lived in the U.S. four years in a seminary, uh, Josephite seminary, a Christian seminary. So uh, always at the morning, breakfast, lunch, dinner, we had a very, very good and uh, very fruitful conversation about religion, how and uh, making friendship. I brought some of my friends to my community. Uh, when I'm saying my community here, I mean the Josephite Society. 
So they learn about Judified and about uh, Catholic faith and about Christianity. And also I invited some priests to my community, to the Imam Mahdi Center in a different occasion to give lecture. Some of them uh, gave lectures, some of them only participated. Uh, and we had a very, very good conversation about the Prophet Muhammad, about uh, understanding each other. So also I'm working with the American Council for International Education as a religious advisor and so I help students to get familiar with the American culture, particularly uh, American religion, including Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, and like that. I participate in different panels, interface dialogue with uh, priests and rabbis and monks and all these religious leaders and practitioners. And I think this is very, very important to explore the majesty and beauty of God in others. And this is what connects me with the other religion. And I would like to expand on it when there is a time. Yes, that's actually a great lead in to our first question. Um, all three of you have a wide variety of experience with interreligious dialogue, but you're all three also people of faith yourself. You have your own belief system um, and spiritual tradition. Within your religion or your faith, do you think that there is something in particular that compels you? to interact with people of other faiths or to have interfaith dialogue? I'll go ahead and go first. For Unitarian Universalism, it's really core to our principles. As I said, we're not belief-based. We uh, uh, organize ourselves around covenants, promises to one another about how we will treat one another and what we um, will support. And we have principles that we uh, covenant to affirm and promote. And they include the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, a world community of peace, and the interdependent web of all life, which means it's in, imperative for us to be able to uh, follow these principles and to get to know other people and to understand what is the, the, their uh, faith, what gives them uh, meaning in their life. So even as I ask each person in my own congregation to tell me, uh, to discern what gives them meaning in their life, it's important for us to learn from others because there's been so many uh, great teachings and so much wisdom in the world. It's ridiculous not to get to know as much of it as we can. So it's actually core to us to be able to reach out into the world and ask other people different from ourselves. Why do you do the things you do? What do you love? What does your faith call you to do? And how do you live your life? And we learn from one another that way. So, um, Yes, I mean, the Christian tradition, um, you know, has a long and variegated history, uh, but right from the beginning words of the Gospel of John, um, you know, all things were created by the Word of God, and so somehow the Word of God is just echoing through all of creation. It's captured well in a, um, a Jesuit um, kind of adage, uh, God in all things. Um, so I think what propels my tradition um, and this has, you know, gone up and down over the centuries. There's all sorts of uh, political and social, economic, and other factors at play here. But certainly since the Second Vatican Council and some clear statements in a document called Nostra Aetate, very positive statements about other religions. And so um, echoing something that Imam Akhlaq said earlier, I mean, how can we find the greatness of God's guidance if we really believe that God is guiding and is not abandoning uh, his creation, um, um, that needs to be unveiled. Um, how can we see the guidance of God at work? I mean, it, it could be through someone's mind, it could be through someone's imaginations, their feelings. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be in particular religious traditions. Uh, even, you know, adversity teaches us how to be better, to be better people, to be more virtuous, to be more sensitive to the suffering of others. And so, so and God is guiding us in, 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 in limitless ways. And so uh, what we do uh, in my program is to try and unveil that through the kind of study, through knowledge, but knowledge that's always in a dynamic relation with the human person, because religion is never simply reducible to words on a page. Uh, it's always about a dynamic relation between the believer and his or her uh, tradition. And so 
I guess one thing though I want to point out is that we do have to be a little bit careful because not all religions are the same and sometimes interfaith dialogue can just um, get involved in what I call the dilution the dilution of people's faiths and that I mean that's a, that's a problem because that's not how people um, you know believers themselves they don't say well my religion is the same as anyone others you know and so we need to be because if we start saying that, I think sometimes interreligious dialogue can be, oh, we're all the same. All our religions are the same. Um, and so therefore, nothing really matters. Now, I mean, there are differences, and, and it's how we understand those differences. And so rather than interfaith being about dilution of people's faith commitment, what I talk about is how, um, and, and coming out of my own tradition, how, how interfaith can be about deliverance from delusion. Deliverance, not dilution. <laughs> Not dilution, but deliverance from delusion. And what do I mean? Delusion about others, uh, delusions, delusions we have about ourselves as somehow the exclusive bearers of truth. Truth is just incredibly vast, um, and we have to be humble. And so ultimately, um, this this interfaith thing is, is 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 it's a religious construct. Some people think, oh, you know, this interfaith thing is is to try and pacify believers and get them not to take their own religious commitments too seriously. Um, and, and I think actually, no, it's, 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 it's about, um, it's, it's interfaith is calling us to discover the, the greatness of, of how God is guiding um, everything uh, in one way or another. I don't know anyone who says, I'm guided by falsehood. So let's, let's ask them, okay, well, what are you guided by? What are you guided by? And again, as a scholar, I want to connect that to centuries, to centuries of tradition, thinking, religious meanings, but connecting it with the, the very um, real lives of, of believers today. And let, let me just, before you say something, what you said is so important about interfaith does not mean everybody mushing together and finding the lowest common denominator. In fact, I tend to not use the word interfaith because I find that if people think that's what it means, I'd like to use the term multi-faith. Multi-faith implies that each faith is unique and we get the multiplicity of faiths together to meet each other with our uniquenesses. So, and not that the, the interfaith word is wrong, but I just know so many people have made that slip. Yeah, and if I could just, sorry, have one yeah. thing <laughs> very often. Because um, I think there's a fear of relativism. Right. There's a fear of, if, oh, it's all the same. same. And, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, maybe we can uh, use the metaphor of rainbow, that they, uh, there is a different color, right. but uh, they together uh, exhibit the beauty of the pictures so this is what the religion come together and uh, yes but uh, with regard to the islamic context there are so many things that encourage us to open us to other faith and this is what uh, actually inspire muslim to uh, come to dialogue with other religion there is a very very uh, famous verse of Quran saying Ya Ahl al-Qutab ta'alu ila kalimata baynana kalimata sabah baynana So people of the book come to the uh, common world to uh, work together, to understand together and to live together and to make a better community and qualified life for everybody and there are many many verses in the Quran they saying the all people of the face uh, they're looking for the truth, they're looking for the uh, beautiful things, they're looking for the uh, being benevolent and good people. So, for example, they, they, they are verses are saying, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ حَادُوا وَنَصَارَ وَالصَّابِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخَرِ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هِمْ يَحْزَنُونَ It means the people of the Jew, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Sabin, that was a religion at the time of the Prophet, and the other people, Everybody who do good things, they will be rewarded before God. And they, uh, there is no need to be afraid about the other life. Uh, and also, we have many things in Islamic context that encourage Muslims to look for other, to look, to, to look at other cultures. Seer of al is a very important thing in Islamic context, saying, uh, do not limit yourself to your culture, to your geography, to your tradition. Try to explore other things. Try to understand other people, other way of thinking, way of life, way of perspective toward the truth, toward the reality, and all this kind of stuff. 
in, in practice, the Prophet Muhammad used to do this. When he was at the Medina, he was living with the Christian people right. and Jewish people. Correct. And he made a very good uh, relationship with them. He put uh, a conversation table before, and he had a very, very positive and constructive relationship with them. All this kind of stuff actually encouraged Muslims and encouraged me to open to others and do not limit God to one thing. I would like to, because before I talk about the, how the majesty and beauty of God is manifested in different things, right now I want to end my point with one hadith of the Prophet that said, look after the wisdom, even it comes from infidel, uh, unbeliever person. So if the prophet says this, of course, he is more interested and encouraging to look uh, for the wisdom from faithful and other people. Imam Akhla can keep setting us up perfectly for the next question, <laughs> oh, okay. which is a really good sign. So as people of faith who have been exploring relationships with people of other faiths, is there something in particular that you really that you have seen in another faith system or another religion that you really value? Oh, really? Yeah, the listeners are okay. So, I, actually, there are two points, or I can refer to two aspects. One uh, with regard to understanding. So, I think uh, other religion, uh, many people in. Uh, different faith, they think on, uh, they can only elaborate and uh, understand the truth. But if they look at the other religion, they can find a big scholarship and big interpretation of the truth that everybody can find a fit understanding for him or herself. This is one point. So I mean, there we can un, uh, learn from other understanding of the truth, other understanding of God, other understanding of the face, how they look, what they looking for in their face. And uh, the second point is with regard to practice. Uh, I would like to give an example to make it uh, uh, more understandable. So in Islamic culture, in Islamic way of worship, we uh, try to worship God, to do du'a and salat in loud voice. Uh, but in Christian, we have not like that everywhere. Particularly when you, I go to the churches, they like to meditate. They like to think. They like to uh, keep themselves in silence and be with themselves. I think this is the way that Muslims can learn from Christians. Uh, like this, there are something that Christians can learn from Islam. And I give you one more example. One of priests that I invited him to my community, he joined us in our prayer. And after we returned to our seminary, I asked him, what was wonderful for you? What you learned? What do you think? And he said, it was very interesting for me that you Muslim, when you're praying, when you're worshiping, you use all body in the uh, different uh, form and it uh, means a lot for me, make sense for me a lot. So we can learn through practice, uh, through understanding each other, not only each other, not to improve our faith, but also to improve our understanding of the truth and approach God uh, closer and closer. Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, it's an interesting question because for me, I, I um, see people's faith most in how they live, how they act it out. And so, of course, I'm very respectful and joyful when I see um, members of the different faith communities coming together to build power, to uh, hold elected officials accountable, to actually spend hours and hours and hours in the streets getting out the vote, you know, things like this. So I, I'm very inspired that their religions have, have given them the next meaning in life. But thinking about a, a couple of things, a, a very dear friend of mine who's a conservative rabbi said that she thinks that one of the problems actually that the United States has to face is that um, the direct Declaration of Independence says that um, um, there are certain inalienable rights. So everything that, that, are, that we're 
based on is of the rights of people, the rights. And she said, from her reading of her Hebrew scriptures and all the, the people in her tradition, the conservative um, tradition, the Talmud, all that, um, they don't talk about people's rights. They talk about people's obligations. And she wondered how different would it be for communities to come together and before they speak about rights, speak about obligations. And I thought that's certainly interesting. And that's something that her community brings to our larger multi-faith community when we're trying to uh, talk with each other about how do we, how do we do work together. And another one uh, that I know is a gift for me, um, we, you know, I, I love the, um, the Islamic way of praying where you, it's basically a dance. So your body becomes the prayer as well as your thoughts and as the words. And in the African-American um, Christian community, I, the same, I see the same thing. I see an incarnation of their faith. I see it, uh, they can bring a joy to their resistance, you know, to pain and grief. They can also bring a certain kind of, they are able to, um, to move, to, to sing with joy, to mourn, to, to, um, to, to mourn what is lost, and then to sing with joy at the promise of what their faith is telling them is gonna happen. And, and it's just such a body experience, and that's something that I learned from that tradition. So I'm so grateful that I've gotten to know so many of those leaders um, in my community organizing. Uh, before I give the floor to the <laughs> professor, I would like to list on the two, uh, two titles or two things uh, uh, about the notion. I think a Muslim can learn from the Christians, particularly when they are talking about the love and the central uh, position that it has in their religion. Uh, also, uh, Christian and other people can learn about the uh, central position of justice in Islam. This is the something that can learn from each other. Right. So, so just to add to that very quickly, I mean, having grown up with Jews, I mean, for me, Judaism is joy. Um, I mean, around the Torah, they sometimes dance, and you know, I mean, Jews are all sorts of things, but in my experience, that's what really captures Judaism, is a joy that they have in, in so much that they do. Um, I lived in India for a year, where I was, I was studying Hindu philosophy for a year, and for me, Hinduism is about the oneness of being, that we're all somehow in, interconnected in this, in this larger being. Um, and so that's something about Hinduism that really has struck me and has stayed with me. Um, in terms of Islam, and, and it's what I focus on in my, my, my work, um, the, the term is sabr, you know, it's patience is the term, it's, it's about ethical fortitude. I see, I see our Muslim brothers and sisters, they have this strong sense of moral vigor, even when things are going bad. They're really, no, we need to be committed. Uh, and that's really struck me uh, very strongly about uh, Islam. Now, I guess I want to just make one point, because all of these things that I've discovered in, in other traditions, have helped me discover those things in my own tradition. So this is not like a um, either or thing. And, and I also want to emphasize um, that this isn't about like somehow uh, downplaying my own tradition. So I'm from a very, very traditional Catholic family. Uh, and we pray in very, very traditional ways. Um, but this is the question, what is the prayer for? Do we pray in order to be closed off from others? or? Do we pray, and we talked about, we talk about, in my family, we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Do we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit to kind of lord them over others or to, to, to engage others? Are we empowered by our prayer to be closed off? Or does our prayer empower us to go out to others, right? And so this is a key issue because, um, again, I think sometimes there's some discomfort about you know, talking about all the good things in other religions. And, and, and you know, uh, for me, what I'm talking about when I say these things about other traditions, it's coming from a very traditional religious point of view, so. As we explore these topics about learning about our own faith and beliefs and, and also engaging with other belief systems, I think there, there's kind of a fine line between interfaith or multi-faith dialogue and evangelism. Could you, any of you speak a little bit to what's the difference between having a multi-faith discussion and, and evangelizing? Good, yeah, I, I would like to start here. <laughs> yeah, because it is a very uh, important point for Muslim students uh, and in Islamic and Middle Eastern uh, culture, 
uh, many times they are mixed and they think uh, religious pluralism, interreligious dialogue, multi, uh, multiple uh, religious approach equates uh, evangelicalism. And it is wrong because in evangelical, uh, if I pronounce uh, perfect, uh, evangelicalism, we, uh, a person who works in this machinery wants to convince others to change uh, his or her faith, to convert. But in interreligious uh, dialogue, we want to open ourselves to others. As we said earlier, uh, we want to explore the wisdom, the truth, the beauty, the grace, and benevolence in others. So they are completely two different, uh, different things. We don't want in interreligious way to convince other people to change their faith, but we want to uh, share with them all religious experiences and say, okay, there are many commonalities between humans and there are different approaches to experience the truth. We have a very good quotation of the prophet that many Sufi use that and we have similar in other faith that uh, uh, Prophet said, uh, as much as, uh, as many as people, there are ways to God. So it says a lot about this issue, and I would like to leave for okay. questions. Sure. Um, so thank you, yeah. Um, I would just add a little, a little twist to this. Um, um, I mean, evangelization, um, it's a kind of a Christian term, but of course Muslims call people to their faith. I don't know if you could call it quran Jewization. <laughs> but in any event, um, for me, now this might sound a bit odd at first, so bear with me. Interfaith and evangelization are really closely connected. Now, of course, it, means, it, it depends what we mean by evangelization. What does mission mean? What does it mean for a believer to have a mission? Does it mean um, domination and getting other people... Uh, subject to my beliefs, I think that shows actually a lack of trust, a lack of trust in God, that God is guiding. So mission doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't mean, it often has unfortunately meant in some contexts domination, but mission really means witness, the witness uh, to the good news. Uh, evangelization comes from um, Gospel and gospel just means the good news. And so yes, when I'm doing interfaith stuff, I feel I'm witnessing to the good news uh, To the good news in life in people's lives um, Now I'm talking here about human solidarity around the good news of God What's the good news of God? The good news of God is that God never ceases to touch the human heart and transform the human heart um, Now for me that's interfaith and it's also evangelizing now that doesn't mean people are coming into my particular faith tradition, but for me, um, that's what it means to witness to the good news, is to, to build human solidarity um, and to witness to the good news of God. God, again, touching our heart and transforming our heart. Um, and then, you know, trusting God after that to lead people as God wants, because uh, he'll take care of it. Or she, good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that the problem with using words is that people, have used really good words, like finding a mission in life is wonderful, and being an evangelistic uh, witness to your joy is wonderful. But people have used those words in ways that are very destructive and manipulative. Um, so I, I tend to make the distinction for my congregation. Uh, I believe that we should be evangelists. In other words, we should tell our own good news. Uh, for Unitarian Universalists, it's maybe not quite the same good news, but it's, it's the good news of, um, that each of us can find a pathway that, uh, that makes sense of our lives. And the word that I use that, that we don't do is proselytizing. In other words, while we may evangelize and tell people our good news, we don't try to change them uh, in ways that we think, we think is the right choice, it, that they need to find their own paths. And so that's the distinction I try to make. And um, I think it doesn't serve, Marianne Williamson said in one of her uh, famous quotes that I think Nelson Mandela quoted her, is that it doesn't serve anybody if you don't let your light shine. So if you really believe something, if you really have strong faith, let it out there because that, in that doing that, you're giving other people to, to also the permission to say what they believe and what their strong faith is. And if we all have a strong faith in um, 
life and love and uh, a beautiful community together, uh, we can work on it. And uh, we cannot do it if we try to control each other or lessen somebody else around us. Um, we've been so far asking you mostly questions that were presented in advance, and now we have a live question that I think it's really good time for. Um, and you've touched on this already, all three of you, I think, but what do you see as an obstacle to interfaith relations or multi-faith relations? And I think by that I'd say to living peacefully with different belief systems in the same community. What is an obstacle to that? Um, the biggest obstacle I've discovered is um, people's fear, their insecurity, their doubts. Um, they want to be loving and understanding and hold hands and get to know each other, but there are really differences among faiths and there are differences among cultures. And some people don't have the, um, the clarity of themselves to be able to really meet those differences and not be threatened by them. And so sometimes you do have to really spend a lot of time getting to know each other before you can really start to deal with some issues that are a little, can be a little difficult. Um, there may be a power imbalance between two communities, there may be some political stuff that's going on in the world that confuses your thinking. Um, so that really gets in the way, and that's why it's so important, I'm so glad that you mentioned this, that it, you really have to start interfaith and multi-faith work, I believe, with people getting to know each other as people. And then you can start talking about what is it you love and how does that lead your life forward. So I, I can only just quickly uh, echo and affirm that. Um, I just call it the weight of history. Um, the weight of history is on our shoulders. Um, you know, when I engage a situation in Morocco, um, you know, there's centuries of uh, tension and suspicion between uh, European Christendom and the abode of Islam. Um, and so that weight of history um, um, I'm sometimes amazed at how, how much progress we can actually make in, 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 in bringing people together, given that centuries-old history. But there's lots of fears and, and lots of uh, suspicions to overcome, and, and some of the suspicions are reasonable. Uh, even to this day, as, as Reverend uh, Linda just mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of power politics uh, involved, uh, sometimes in interreligious dialogue, which is sometimes uh, connected to CVE concerns. Um, and you know, CVE. It's country violent extremism. Thank you. Country violent, thank you for <laughs> we just use these terms in DC. Uh, and I mean, there are concerns about violent extremism, and I don't want to downplay that, but that, that concern, the, that CVE concern, can sometimes um, drive the ship of interfaith encounter. And so the point is, you know, to kind of pacify the believers because there's an assumption that belief is going to inevitably lead people to violence. And so the CVE thing can sometimes hang over. Um, so, so there are historical uh, reasons, but there's also current issues. There's power. There's always power involved. And so at the very least, we have to be aware of this. And, 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 and to go back to this point, it's, you know, we call it in SORAC, we call it uh, scholarly companionship, right? We, to get to know someone, it's not just enough to read about them. Or you could just call it the politics of intimacy, right? And, and, and that'll build up trust. It's just meeting people. Um, and when that trust is there, when they see you don't have an agenda, when they see this is really what we talk about and what this is really what you love, this is really for the face of God what we're doing. It's not for the face of one nation or another or one particular society or nation or community. Um, great, great things can happen, but, but there's, there are those obstacles um, that aren't going to go away soon. And so we always have to be aware, um, but also trust, uh, too, that, that, that that trust can uh, come about, um, and it doesn't take too much, but it does, you know, you have to be there. Yeah, and actually what the speaker covered a very, very important issues, and I would like to continue from the uh, point that Paul uh, stopped is about the, uh, I call it separation or living separated. So if they are not, uh, in connection and they are not right. build a uh, friendship and uh, being together it make a lot of problem this is one obstacle the other that i would like to emphasize the ignorance uh -huh. so when they have no knowledge about the others they are filled with their presupposition with a lot of things that they are uh, wrong so uh, i think if they learn more if they have get more knowledge, they will come closer together 
and uh, I, I, I don't want to repeat what the uh, uh, minister said. Uh, I'm completely agree with both uh, a statement about the political, historical, and uh, some you know, social uh, uh, things that uh, has an impact here. We are getting so many great questions, and great. thankfully, we're only halfway done with our time. <laughs> okay. So, um, and we've been getting so many great answers from you all, too. Just reminding our participants, keep sending in your questions. Uh, we are gathering them. We won't be able to ask all of them. Um, but the next question sort of tags onto what you, you've been talking about, but moves it away from um, faith groups and, and asks about cultural differences. To what extent do you think cultural differences also have an effect on interfaith or multi-faith dialogue? And what is the most effective way that interfaith workers could bridge those cultural gaps? Wow, that's a huge question. <laughs> right, right. I'll take a stab. Um, you know, I would just say stereotypes and generalizations. Um, you've got to get that on the table. Those are rampant. Uh, especially in this day of instant media. Um, the media has such a big impact on us, and that can be a good thing. If like a tragedy happens, uh, the globe can rally around it, um, and that can bring people together, but the media can be incredibly divisive uh, because of these generalizations, because of these uh, sometimes rampant uh, stereotypes. Uh, you know, we live in this age uh, where anyone can say anything on, on the media, and so, uh, we really need to be fortified with, with knowledge. Um, so just for an example, I mean, when I, when I engage non-Christians about Christianity, for them, Christianity is about the white West, and therefore it's about power and global dominion. And when I talk to non-Muslims uh, about Islam, oh, it's this defeated, problematic, uh, dark people. You know, these are just rampant stereotypes. I mean, the, 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 the majority of Christians today are, are poor and, and, and colored, actually. They're, the majority of Christians today are in, you know, in, in the southern hemisphere or in the east. Uh, the majority of Christians today are people of color. Um, and, of course, Islam is incredibly diverse. Um, you know, uh, you, know you, you have all kinds of Muslims of all kinds of colors, uh, but that's what, that's what people think. There's this kind of culturalization of religion or racialization of, of religious identity. Um, and, um, you know, we've been talking about things like uh, meeting people and, and the politics of intimacy, and that's all good too, but it has to be fortified by knowledge. When I talk to uh, undergrads and also uh, high school students, when you enter in that, into that internet, what are you fortified with so that you won't simply be at the whim of those stereotypes? And, you know, you need certain principles, you know, that, for example, there's, there's no uh, society, there's no civilization, um, if, it, if it's still continuing, there's no civilization without values. <laughs> if a civilization is still continuing, it has to have values to hold together. And so, you know, if you see something in the media where it's saying all those people are that way, or all those people are this way, you know that's wrong. Uh, because any, any group will not continue unless it has some values. Yeah, there might be some people who aren't holding those values close and living them out. Um, but yeah, so these, I would just say that the, these, these generalizations, uh, these, these stereotypes, uh, again, what I call the culturalization or the r racialization of religious identity, of national identity, somehow suddenly people are in boxes. And that's where, you know, in addition to the politics of in intimacy, we need knowledge. Because sometimes I see interreligious dialogue, people getting together and there are all these nice pleasantries and yeah. But Without knowledge, it won't last. It won't last without knowledge, unless all of this is really rooted in serious knowledge of what the importance of religious pluralism is all about. And, and, and therefore, we have that knowledge to kind of counter these cultural um, un, 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 and unfortunate ambiguities that are rampant in the media today. Yeah. I'm really glad this question came up because in fact, you would find even within any faith tradition, the same challenges of of different cultures within that faith tradition. So how do, how do people from different cultures claiming that they are of that faith really get along with each other? And I bet you there's just as much chance for intercultural conversation within one faith that would be just as challenging and interesting. 
Um, what I would I agree with everything you said about knowledge and, and intimacy. I think the other thing that has to happen uh, for people to be able to understand um, the, the notion of culture and the power it has in our lives is to become a little humble and to realize that you probably don't know as much about the different cultures as you think you do. And it could be stereotypes, but it could just be because we don't even know how monocultural our view of the world is. It takes a lot of experience, which is why I think students who travel and live in other cultures are really you know, many steps ahead of others uh, because you actually get a chance to see the world from a different place on the planet. You get to walk in somebody else's shoes for a while. And if you can keep that humble quality of not assuming that everybody is thinking the same way you are, but sort of watching and listening and paying attention and asking questions. And we call this developing intercultural competency. And it has to start with a humility of knowing that I don't understand culture and, and I need to learn more. And then as you start to understand the differences and how much you need to learn, you can be, start to become a little more competent to learn how to relate with cultures different than your own. And even maybe to understand your own culture for the first time. Actually, this is a, a little controversial with regard to Islam. Uh, maybe this is a one uh, a difference between Islam and Christianity that uh, purities in Islam make some problems. So I think uh, we have in Islamic context, we have to find, and this is the, what Imams doing and the scholars are doing, to balance between uh, a culturalization in Islam and Islamic identity to make a mixture of the uh, of both because the cu culture helped Muslim to understand Islam from humanistic viewpoint I would like to say from a human other ways uh, there is a potential in Islamic text to uh, uh, interpret in a, a radical way uh, so this is the, the essence and the nature of Islam that uh, there is a uh, harmony between reason and revelation, what is called in Islam, aql and wahid, between the text and the understanding of text. And the culture gives Muslims the opportunity to learn about Islam. So I think we have to celebrate the multiculturalism. And uh, this is one way that can help Muslims to understand each other better, uh, better and other religion better. Because, for example, the Muslim in uh, Saudi Arabia or in Iran, when they see the Muslim in Malaysia or Muslim in uh, uh, Senegal, uh, acts in different way, but they are a Muslim still, so they can think, okay, I can act in different way, I can dress in different way, but still I can be a Muslim. It opens the way of uh, diversity, uh, multiple culture, and how to deal with that. So I think. Um, uh, uh, examining the relationship between culture and faith in Islamic context can help students to open to different culture, to a uh, diverse way of life and different, uh, different attitude toward faith and religion. Can I just quickly, very quickly add to that? I think that's really, really important in general, even aside from you know, the interfaith stuff. I think there's a common idea today and I think we're, Reverend Linda touched upon it before, that, that, that religion is about doctrines. Religion is about doctrines that we either, you know, accept or reject in our mind, where, in fact, you know, the culture and the, 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 the things that humans do, whether it's literature or, 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 or social activism, charity work, all of that is deep in any culture. And that, so there isn't, there isn't any clear, like, boundary between faith and culture, and that, that more needs to be explored, and I think that'll be a very rich uh, trajectory for all of us. And, and, and I, yeah, and, and religion's about doctrine, but there's some religions where it's not so much about doctrine, and it's more about covenant. Um, I say Judaism, Buddhism, Unitarian Universalism, it, it's, it's the principles, it's how you live together, as opposed to um, necessarily teachings that you must follow. But that, that's, my, that's my distinction on what? Getting some nuance between our panelists, nuance, which is yeah. great, yeah. I don't know about everybody who's listening in from home, but um, sometimes I get to a point where I've heard so much and so much food for thought that you can almost feel like, will I ever be able to do this kind of work myself? 
So one of the questions that our uh, participants are asking is, how could I, as a young person in one of these countries around the world, how could I undertake a self-assessment on my readiness to be an effective leader of an interfaith project? Is there a readiness checklist? What are the things I need to know um, or be ready for if I want to start an interfaith project? I would say don't do it by yourself. Instead, start to make friends and find other people who are interested in doing it with you. So start asking people to, to join you for a cup of tea and talking, get to know each other first. And um, uh, as I said, I was just very fortunate that 9-11 made a lot of people say yes to my invitations. I started inviting people, let's get together and talk, let's get together and talk. So I didn't do it by myself. I did it with a lot of other people and together we sort of found the leadership skills or what we needed to do. Um, so that would be one of my tips is, um, I think a good project, and you could be a leader if you would want to say, is simply to get to know people of different faiths in your community. Just figure out who they are, see if they'd like to have a cup of tea with you, and if they want to start, start a conversation. I would just, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. And I just add, I mean, I guess I see maybe three or four things here. Um, you gotta stay ahead of the media. Uh, that's really important. Um, the media is a chameleon, but it can drag us down into despair uh, when we see so much crap going on in the world and we easily despair. Um, and so you have to be above it. Uh, you know, you have, to know, you have to be informed and knowledgeable, uh, but you gotta be really careful about your relation with the media because the media can drag us down. Uh, sometimes we feel that we're, 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 le we're living the traumas of the whole world today. And we gotta be, because that can just, you know, pull the word. So, you, 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 so that's the first thing I would say, but connected to that, you gotta know your heart. You really gotta spend some time reflecting, um, listening to the voice of God in your heart, because uh, that's what's gonna help you uh, continue and persevere. Um, and so really uh, taking time to pray and reflect and discern and, and remember, taking time to remember what God is saying to you in the depths of your heart, okay? And people forget about that. Um, it's important to have the professional competence standards, but I think without this, you're not gonna continue. And so that's the second thing I'd say, that you really need to spend time every day, every week, every month, year, taking time to listen to your heart. And, and doing that in conversation uh, with others, especially people who are perhaps, you know, uh, spiritually, uh, spiritual experts, uh, so that they can help you process what you're listening to. Um, and then the third thing, I just echo uh, what was just said. Um, sometimes people think, oh, I could have this big, big fanfare event. Uh, not at all, no, in fact, that's a mistake. I've seen too many people, you know, they, they have these big fanfare events and it just peters out very quickly. So uh, start, you know, with patience and, and this is a long-term project and you have to put friendship before fanfare. Oh. You have to put friendship before fanfare. That's what's gonna help you succeed. Um, and, and building that synergy uh, with others in very simple ways. Um, but yeah, also realizing in, it's gonna take many years. It's gonna be a great adventure. It will be a great adventure, but, but you, you have to do these things to help you stay inspired and uh, focused on your goal and focused on God. Excellent, yeah, I agree. 100 percent and i would like to add something more so yeah or to express in different way uh, so the first thing that i would like to emphasize is that to do not be biased so uh, when you want to learn about other faiths uh, open your heart and think that uh, you, uh, what you learn about others they are a stereotype they are generalization they are maybe not uh, accurate things. So open your heart to others and uh, have a, some kind of the criteria in your heart. The, the professor talked about the, the voice of God or word of God in the heart. So different things we can use uh, to talk about that. It is the matter of self-reflection, to think of yourself, have some fundamental uh, criteria and examine with them what you hear, what you see. You know, we have a very beautiful verses of Quran saying that all people come back to the, your nature. And this is the faith, uh, this is the real religion, real faith that everybody needs that. So this is the first point. Do not be biased, be open to others and try to have something in your heart uh, 
uh, with your consciousness, with your wisdom, with your fitra to evaluate what you hear or what you get. The second point is uh, have a kind of a study plan. It's a, a, not a short time journey. It's a long time journey. So uh, start from uh, important texts, books, or uh, you can get some consult from other religious leader or some people who knows and can help students to uh, learn about other faiths. Uh, and uh, another thing is that if there is a possible group or to both inter and intra phase dialogue. So uh, I would like to encourage the students to keep both way, inter and intra uh, phase dialogue. Not only, for example, in many Muslim countries, maybe there are not uh, a lot of other uh, faiths. So I encourage them to go to other denominations, sect of Islam. Uh, to their worship places. If there is other place, go to their worship places. Only look, don't judge, only look and listen and open your heart and then uh, see what you find. This is a, something that comes to my mind. Right. One of the things that we talked about in our first session of this uh, workshop is the risks associated with interfaith work. And I think one of the things that everyone needs to be ready to do interfaith work is to acknowledge that there might be some personal risks or even some physical or social um, risks. Have any of you ever experienced, one of the risks that we anticipate is discrimination. Have any of you ever experienced any discrimination because of your um, belief system, because you are open or active about your religion, either in an interfaith context or outside of that? Personally, yes. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, there is a good place to explain it, uh, but I only refer to that, yes, because I grew up in a very conservative culture, in a very um, uh, conservative country. So, and because my involvement with the uh, non Muslim uh, people, so I receive a lot of. Uh, criticism and sometimes threat about my work and from people of your faith. Yeah, yeah, uh, people of my faith, particularly in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, as I said before, uh, I emphasized on the difference between interreligious dialogue and evangelicalism because of that context. Yeah, I agree with both the speaker about the uh, to be to witness your face, but. Unfortunately, in many conservative countries, when you are talking about the other face, they think you are, uh, you are, uh, you spread the, their words to, yeah, uh, to, uh, to encourage people to, compare, uh, to um, change their faith. So this is a big problem sometimes, but however, uh, a big work cannot be done without taking some risks. And uh, particular one thing with being a young person is that the person uh, looks for the truth and has the uh, courage to accept the uh, side effect and what comes with that. When uh, the age go up, people become more conservative. So I encourage to take part of this um, uh, age I take uh, benefit of this uh, age. The Prophet Muhammad used to say, that I love young youth because when the aged people rejected me, youth came to me uh, and they welcomed me because they are open minded and they want to take a risk for the truth and understand the reality. It's interesting being a white person and a woman of some privilege. I don't know that I've ever experienced much risk, um, but what I would say, there is risk. Um, um, and, and what I would say to anybody who's thinking about doing any kind of work, whether you're in a, a society that may not approve it or not, is to sort of do an, an analysis, uh, talk to some people and find out are people in my own community going to get mad at me for doing this? Or will I risk something from somebody outside of the community? Will I risk being misunderstood? Will I um, you know, risk something worse, physical or even you know, my, my personal freedom? Um, and 
So do a power analysis, talk to people about it, and so that you make the decision to take the risk. And then I would say again, my, my mantra, don't do it alone. The more people you have to share the risk, um, the, the, the more powerful it feels. And the more people, the bigger risk you can take. Um, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to just do a, a quiet personal risk as opposed to joining with others and, and sharing that risk. Yeah, so I've never felt um, threatened uh, physically, um, but I mean, I have felt greatly misunderstood. Yes, um, that hurts my feelings. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, and that's a challenge because sometimes we, 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 our response is, well, just piss off, you know, what? I don't need this. I've got a, I've got a job in a, in a very privileged world. I don't need to be out here doing these things. But, but of course, that's not what I'm about, and that's not what we're about. Um, you know, so um, you know, sometimes that misunderstanding has come from my own community. Uh, why are you spending so much time with Muslims? Um, what's this all about? And, but also, you know, from Muslims too. Uh, I remember, especially when I teach on Christianity. Uh, when I go to Muslim societies, I lecture on Christianity and Judaism. They, they don't need me to teach them Islam. So when I go there, they, you know, I'm invited to teach uh, courses on the history of Christianity, whether in America or just uh, the history of Christianity in general. And I remember the first time I did it. And, you know, for the first two months, um, there were just really, um, I would say, uh, you know, questions that were meant to, um, to provoke me, um, to put it mildly, about me being a polytheist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm very uh, equipped in how to explain that. Uh, what is the Christian conception of God in, 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 in comprehensible categories? But, but that's not enough. Um, um, and so uh, what, 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 what I started to do, and I still do, is I, I, when people misunderstand me um, in the name of faith, their faith or my faith, I asked them to pray for me. Um, and you can't imagine, I mean, after the years of doing this, how many people are praying for, for me from other traditions and how many people from other traditions have asked me to pray for them. And suddenly we have this network of prayer across religions and there's nothing like prayer for others that will soften our hearts. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a simple thing, you know. Um, okay, you know, you know, you think that about my religion, but, um, you know, I'm having a tough day, or my stepmother's having a tough time, and we could use your prayers, and I know you pray. Um, and, you know, my Muslim friends, I mean, it's just nothing puts a, a beam on their face when I say to them, could you pray for my family or my friend or this issue or that issue? And suddenly we're bonded around that. And these are people who initially would have um, misunderstood me and maybe even more than misunderstood me. They would have been wanted to be a little bit even kind of attacking me polemically, not physically, but uh, in their words and in their ideas. Um, and ultimately, too, um, you know, like I said, we have to decide what our commitments are. And I think um, in the societies where I go to, uh, Muslim societies, you know, they see people come and go, you know, whether from international institutions or from other nations or, you know, even from other church communities. You know, people, someone comes in. And so, um, when they see that, 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 that we're committed to them, um, you know, so, so these people who, you know, have a lot of problems with me, um, you know, it's amazing what's happened when they see, I mean, like after two months of what happened, they're just like, you're still here, you're still here. Um, and suddenly that can change everything. And so I just want to encourage people, there are going to be moments of frustration at many levels I mean, there could be there could be some serious persecution, um, and that's not to pick on one community or another. Um, but you know, um, when you stick in there, I mean, people are amazed when they see that you're committed to them, and that can just have a transformative effect. So. Um, quick disclaimer to the Yes alumni and Yes Abroad alumni listening in. We are in no way encouraging you to take major risks no. with your projects. Um, this is an ongoing discussion about being aware of the, the potential risks. And if any of you are ever worried or have questions about a project, um, you can reach out to uh, staff from the YES program or to other alumni and just make sure that you're making good decisions. Um, now, another question, just along with those challenges, the sort of social or intangible challenges, some of our alumni are worried about uh, facing other challenges, uh, limited resources in particular, both time, money, space, maybe participants. 
And they're asking, what is the best way to motivate people to maintain interfaith projects in the medium and the long term when you have limited resources? So it might be easy to do a one-off, to do a one-day event or something, but how do we keep it going when we have both those challenges and limited resources? I mean, I think, I think Reverend Linda has, 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 has talked to it before, um, you know, alliances and, 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 and strength in numbers. Um, um, and I just add to that, you know, your dreams, um, but your shared dreams. Um, I mean, there have been some moments where I, you know, wow, we've, we've got $80 left in the bank, you know, um, or um, those big institutions that we thought were gonna come through, they didn't come through uh, in supporting us in one way or another. Um, and, and yet the people who, who I've partnered with uh, and befriended, I mean, they're like, well, no, don't worry. Uh, we're going to get through this, and, 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 and God's going to help us finish this. Um, and so uh, that, that power in numbers, and there's just incredible encouragement. Um, now, I'm sure there's more technical ways to, to, to figure this out, but I, I really think that that's an – I've been that, – for me, that just personally, that's been so important where – uh, some some partners, some Moroccan Muslim partners. When I write to them and I'm like, we want to move forward, but there's nothing left here. They're like, don't worry, we're going to be with you. Yeah, and I I would say, and I don't know what the scope of what Yes expects uh, people to do for projects, but I would think that you don't need to do something major and huge and tax a lot of money that would still be a meaningful interface. Um, uh, something I'm thinking, you know, if you made some friends with some few people with different faith traditions. And you talked about, well, let's go to a nursery school and tell stories that come from our faith traditions or, you know, taking care of children or um, let's, let's, let's meet regularly and, and have conversation that could not talk, cost you any money. So I would hope that you would begin um, with people that are in front of you, that you can talk to, that you can maybe come up. As I said, voice is huge. Um, community organizing project that now is, is great and successful and has organized a lot of money and a lot of people. We started off, seriously, it cost me like a few bucks a week just getting together and having a cup of coffee with one person after another person. And then gradually, now if you have a time limit, I don't know if Yes is saying the project has to be due by a certain time, you know, you can speed it up a little bit and not make it, and don't worry if it's not big and grand. If, if it starts even with a few friendships, you don't know, that's a good project right there. A few friendships that say, let's do something together uh, or let's get to know each other better or, you know, I bet I can't wait to hear what you guys come up with. But I don't think it needs to cost a lot of money or even take tons of time. Um, it's much more if you can be present with an open heart and um, um, meet some, some really good people. Great. Uh, I would like to start with the uh, quotation of the Sufi tradition of Islam. It's saying, there is a power in the He is a very great Sufi, the actually kind of master of Rumi, that everybody knows. Right, right. Uh, he said, if you want something, so put your, uh, put your feet on, on the path, then the path will tell you what you do at the next step. Right. So he's saying, so only have the intention, make the decision, and uh, as the uh, minister said, so if you make a little things, it can change a lot. Uh, friendship is the uh, first step to do that. And after you make a friendship, you can come together. You can make a schedule for monthly meeting like that. You can see everywhere in the public library, in a store, in every, and you make some plan together for your neighborhood. It doesn't cost a lot. It doesn't need a lot of money if you, do on the name of faith, interreligious work, then you can, if you clean the street, uh, one Muslim, one Jew, one Christian, uh, only clean your street, then you say, this is the, what my faith say, this is what we learn from each other. It can uh, give a lot of uh, idea to other people. If you visit some people in your neighborhood, some uh, elder people, some sick people, and uh, bring a flower to uh, him or her. So that's it, so that's a lot of things. If you uh, come to the library and pick a book and discuss together, uh, 
so it's a lot of things. So we, need, we don't need to think of a very, very big things. So we can start there from very little. And look to the artist community because art, artists are always looking for opportunities to either share their poetry or sing their song or do stuff with other artists. You can bring other artists from different faith traditions together and you'll find good friends in the artist community. Even if they're not theologians, uh, they love to share their art and usually their art is their way of expressing their faith. And I, you know, most places I've gone, if you get to know a few artists, they would love to get together with you. Just to add to that quickly, I mean, I think that's really important because sometimes we think of you know, religion uh, as a separate category when in fact it's integrated into everything um, in one way or another, whether that's art or music. And so, so people who are feeling a little tight in their budget or resources, they could look to institutions or, or, or NGOs or other organizations that aren't like strictly speaking religious or, or even interfaith, uh, but there's, there's some ways to, to, to build synergy with, with other, other kinds of activities that, that wouldn't immediately strike one as, as religious or interfaith. So you know, it's another way to kind of latch on. I know there's a bunch of you listening right now who are thinking, okay, but I live in a community where everybody is the same faith, um, don't worry, we have lots of great examples from the participants in last year's Interfaith Harmony Workshop of how they did trainings for youth in their communities or Skyped in someone that they met at the workshop. You all can start talking to each other about ways to get involved. Um, there's lots of great examples of that that we can go over with you in our final session next week. Um, for, uh, to, to continue talking about these upcoming projects, do you have any tips for how we can evaluate the results of, an in, of interfaith work? How do you know, maybe not necessarily with data, but maybe with data, how can you determine if an interfaith experience or something that you set out with an intention to have a positive interfaith interaction, how can you know if it was successful? Great, yeah, a few things uh, I would like to mention. One is uh, if you learn about other faiths, so it's a sign that you are at the uh, positive and constructive path. The other thing is about, uh, as we emphasize, making friendship. So if you have friends from other ways, it shows that uh, uh, progress in this way. The other thing is that the change of your uh, perspective. If you compare your approach to other ways before this, uh, initiative and after that and you find the change in your mind yeah. so it shows that you got a lot of things these kind of things can help you to evaluate your achievement in the interface uh, okay yeah and I'm looking not only to the change in yourself but see if, if people want to do something again they, that usually means that they got something out of it too um, and then external recognition if somebody in the community that has heard about your project, even if they weren't part of it, they've heard about it from somebody else and they feed that back. So um, I don't know if you want to set up a way to, to evaluate that way, but it's the internal, it's the people that were the participants, but then maybe even somebody outside of the whole process, if they give you some recognition. Yeah, I would just add a couple of things uh, quickly. I mean, if I've understood the question, how do we evaluate the success? Um, well, um, I mean, when other groups or organizations um, ask us, you know, to come to them, um, I mean, that's that's one thing right there. Um, um, so, um, you know, just just uh, how to how to message. I think I think it is important to think about messaging uh, your project, and so sometimes that's just word of mouth because it's it's a quality thing that we do uh, when we show up at places and. We're a bunch of ragtag Americans from different faith traditions, but we show up and we engage people in the Muslim world and we speak Arabic and we're, you know, we have a kind of a Islam friendly uh, outlook and suddenly they're like, wow, they're not here to change us. Um, and so, you know, that's one way to message it, just the quality of what you're doing. Uh, but also, you know, whether you consider making a little video and, and, and putting that on YouTube, uh, just in keeping it really short, one minute, one minute and a half, two minutes maximum, you know, and sending that out to a variety of partners and contacts. Um, so that's one thing. But I guess, I guess when it comes to this interfaith work, I, I really want to emphasize um, that we have to evaluate it ultimately in non-tangible ways. Uh, we can't do this because we're looking for concrete achievements. Um, now, some of my uh, funding sources want to see very concrete achievements, and so we have to 
we have to work on that. But um, you know, ultimately, as as people have already uh, mentioned, I think this is about uh, the the great achievement is is to bring the poison of hatred out of people's hearts. And it doesn't mean changing them. It doesn't mean changing their beliefs. Um, but it means softening the hearts of people. Um, and I've seen that. Now, I, I can't track that in data and, and, and you know, put it in a grid for, for donors to look at. Uh, you just can't, you can't, you can't really um, you know, put that into data, uh, put that into numbers. Um, but I've seen it again and again and again. People who had hatred in their heart, whether, whatever tradition they were from, and, and to see that go away, um, you know, so I would just, I just emphasize that. Yeah, you do need to do the other stuff, the messaging and, and, and whatnot, um, and the high quality. Um, you know, because maybe if, 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 if no one's paying attention to you, maybe you have to rethink. Maybe you have to rethink. Um, we all need, again, we need to be humble. Um, and maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe, you know, maybe I can ask around. There's always lessons to be learned. Um, um, but at the same time, in addition to those important techniques and message, messaging and whatnot, um, I, I just want to emphasize that, that you, you shouldn't, you, you should do this because you desire to do it, not because you're, 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 you're looking to achieve something. It should be your desire that's driving you to do this, uh, your deep, deep desire, rather than expecting to kind of, you know, achieve something and change the world. I've studied history. I've studied thousands of years of history. The world is not changing, my friends. Um, yes, uh, we have new technology and we have all sorts of new things. But every generation is, if I could use a Christian term, fallen, or to use an Islamic concept, uh, kind of caught up in the deficiencies of human existence and trying to get back to their fitra, their, their true nature. Um, so this is, this is you know, um, we're, we're, if, if we're, we're always going to be slamming our head against the wall if we measure what we do by our achievements. Uh, we need to be uh, reasonable and savvy and all of that, but, but you should, you know, it's, 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 it's these non-tangible things, and especially your deeper desire that should be what, what you use to assess what you're doing. I hope that that response is setting us up for a really positive response to this next question, which sounds a little bit um, doomsday, but one of the questions we've got is, what do you think would happen if interfaith activities are not promoted? So if everybody just stopped their interfaith work, what do you think would be the state of things in our societies? I think uh, one thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is that in our time, in contemporary situation, uh, different faiths do not uh, encounter, do not have problem uh, with other faiths. They have mostly problem with unbelief. So I'm saying that uh, this is one thing that encourage different people of faith to come together because we have not the problem only between Muslim and Christian, Christian and Jewish and like that. We have the uh, problem of believer and non-believer. A person who believe in, uh, uh, in a, a supernatural value and the meaning of life, thinking he or she is not thrown away in the world. There is a, some things that can rely on, there is a, something to uh, trust in. And a person who thinks she or he is alone and nobody can help and no things in the world can support and like that. These kind of things bring people of the faith uh, closer together and help them to uh, learn from each other. And if you have no dialogue with religion and interface dialogue, we, we lose a great support from our fellows. This is one thing that I think we have to emphasize. I would just say two things. I mean, um, you know, without interfaith, people can still be good. You know, you meet lots of people who've never met someone from another religion. They're, they're illiterate, but they're the kindest, wisest of people, okay? So we shouldn't think of interfaith as the thing that's gonna save the world. Uh, now, it certainly can help bring about good and peace and harmony and beauty and all the things that all traditions, uh, theological and philosophical value, okay? Um, but for me, without the interfaith thing, um, we're going to deprive ourselves of something. Um, 
you know, not all religions are the same. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, uh, religious differences should be understood in terms of enmity, and they shouldn't be also understood in terms of like, well, it's all the same and everything's relative. Um, but your, your faith um, and your engagement with people from other faith is going to help you uh, discover who you are. Um, there is no faith that is not dialogical in some sense. Now, it could be dialogical with nature, with the cosmos. You know, I know theologians who think about science and, and religion and, and the cosmos and the greatness of, of the universe and what that means for their own uh, faith understanding. But I think, I think in this moment, particularly, uh, we, have, we have interfaith can offer each of us an opportunity to better understand who we are. We, you cannot do that in a box. You cannot do, you need the other person to know who you are. And without interfaith, you will deprive yourself of something. Um, and, um, you know, just going along with that, and, and, and you know, so uh, wh what will you deprive yourself of? You, you will deprive yourself of understanding how your life, uh, or you will deprive yourself of better, fuller, richer understanding of how your life stands, your body stands at the intersection of humanity and divinity. You will uh, somehow limit yourself of understanding how you can participate in, in the great adventure uh, of God. You, can, you, you will deprive yourself of becoming a greater moral authority. Okay, and that is, we, we, we need interfaith today um, because interfaith will help us become greater moral authorities and that has important political consequences. Um, we live in an age uh, where, where states are trying to uh, define us more and more, uh, define who we're supposed to be or tell us what we're supposed to be. And I think interfaith uh, can really uh, help us become moral, moral authorities, uh, can, can give us a greater foundation in, in seeing ourselves as moral authorities, interacting with people across cultures, across religions, and therefore, in that way, um, they will be a moral authority in society. And that, uh, in my American uh, passion, will be a way to limit states telling us who we should be morally. Yeah, you know, all the things that they said, and I've often reflected, I don't think I could be a minister unless I was engaged in not just multi-faith conversations, but multicultural conversations, multiracial conversations, because I feel like when you when you limit yourself, if it's only one faith talking to itself, well, and in fact, I know some people they don't even talk to the history of themselves. You know, they don't even learn from their own history. So if you're not dialogic, I think what happens is you begin to smother and you begin to die, um, and it, it it's it's and it's killing maybe not your body but it kills your soul. And I can't be a religious leader if I, my soul is killed. And so I think it's true of individual folks who really have a, a sense of wanting to keep their soul vibrant. They need to be talking to people that are as different from them as they can, but also for our society. So that's the individual, but for societies, if societies can't figure out how to do this, if we end up building walls and keeping ourselves separate from one another, it basically will end, to, end up killing the souls of those societies. So I think it's really important. There, we have just discussed such a range of topics. This has been so amazing. And uh, we don't have time for more questions. We're gonna have to uh, maybe type up the remaining questions and see if our three panelists would be willing to write up a couple answers that we can continue this conversation. Um, but to close things off, I noticed that there's only one thing really that's been missing, which is getting to see the faces of these awesome participants. So I'm going to do something kind of crazy that I did not discuss with my teammates in advance, um, which is I'm going to turn on my video and um, bring the computer around. If anybody needs to leave, you are welcome to leave because it's the end of the session. Uh, but if anybody would like to turn their camera on and say hello to the panelists, we can get you guys. If you guys squeeze together, I bet you can all get in there. And Hannah, you could turn yours off if you want. Hey, yeah. hey guys. <laughs> so you can see them. Hey. So we can see you all. Wow, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to see you all. Thank you.
Thank you. Good luck. Good luck with all your projects. Yes. You Thank know, you. Thank you. For ever gazing into our eyes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we just want to get a chance to see, see you, you and connect you. with with exactly. who all cool is. Yeah. Well, that, that makes it the true <laughs> the, the <laughs> yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe next time you do this, put them up on that big screen. Yeah. 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 Be yeah. watching yeah. their faces yeah. while we're constant improvements. Yeah. 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 Always yeah. new yeah. innovations. Yeah. 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 Have you looking at the screen? Yeah, we're going to get a great social media shot here. Oh, yeah. 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 Screen. Engage. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everybody. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Good luck, Good Good luck everyone. Here. Yeah. Come visit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We cannot hear you. Thank you. If you're talking, just know that we're not ignoring you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming, and please give a you know virtual round of applause for our panelists. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, thank you all. Go ahead, and we're going to end the meeting in just a moment, and we will see all of you again in your small groups. Mm -hmm. nice. mm -hmm. Wednesday. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.